Hey there and welcome. My name is Dana Brown and I am Zojo's Director of Marketing. In this video, we're going to see how we can evolve the current Web 2.0 tutorial where we can add a series of tasks. You can find and follow that tutorial in the Zojo documentation website under the tutorial section. In fact, you need to complete that tutorial before starting with this one because we're going to jump right in where we left off. So while with the original tutorial, you can add as many tasks as you need and check them as completed or not, it was not possible to save those tasks in order to retrieve them later. In addition, it was only possible to manage tasks for one user. The thing we're going to do in this continuation of the original tutorial is to add a way to handle several users from the app and also save and retrieve the set of tasks for the username we type in the upper text field of the web app. So for that, we need to add an additional web text field, a web button, and an additional web label, keeping the other items from the original layout. So if we type a name in the upper text field and click on the get button, we'll be able to retrieve all of the tasks for that user. And if we type in another name and click get, then the web app will load and display in the web list box all of the tasks previously saved for that user. Of course, we can change the completion state for any task of the selected user and even create new tasks for the selected user. Let's change to the first user and add a new task for them so we can see how these sets of tasks are unique for every user. But what do you need to do to achieve this? If we look into the Zojo project, we can see how the first thing we need to do is add the new UI controls on the task manager page, a web text field, a web button, and a web label. Probably the most important thing is that we're using a SQLite database in order to handle all of the application data users and tasks. Probably when it's about developing your own apps, you'll be better served using a MySQL or PostgreSQL database here because you don't need to do any specific setup or you don't need additional infrastructure in order to use it. In fact, you can consider using SQLite in your web apps if you don't expect a high number of simultaneous users accessing it. While in other tutorials, we saw several ways and techniques you can do uh, in order to work with SQLite databases. In this tutorial, we're going to use the technique based on creating a SQLite database subclass. As you can see here, we added to the project a new class named TaskDB and whose superclass is SQLite database, as you can see in the inspector panel. The SQLite database is one of the database classes already available in the Zojo programming language. So what can we achieve with this? What does it mean for a class to have a superclass? That means that our task DB class will inherit all the properties, methods, and events that are available in its superclass, in this case, the SQLite database. So in a practical way, that means that our task DB class can access the properties already found in the SQLite database and also call its methods. You can find more information about these in the Zojo documentation. In addition, we can also add new methods and properties that will be specific to our task DB class. That is, we're specializing the SQLite database class so it better fits our needs for the purpose of this web app. In this case, such specialization is storing and retrieving usernames and also the task assigned for every one of these users. The first thing we need to do in our task DB class is add a new constructor method. Observe how the first line of code in the constructor method calls the constructor method on its superclass. This line is automatically added for you every time you add a new method to a subclass that is also available in the superclass it inherits from. After all, it does make sense to do this for the class you're inheriting from to give it the opportunity to initialize itself before you initialize your subclass through the constructor method. In our example, we're using the constructor method to create the file to be used by the SQLite database, and also to make the connection between the file on disk and the database engine itself.
As you can see here, we are also using a conditional compilation block, so the file on disk will point to the one stored in the Documents folder where we're running the web app from the IDE or to any other path that you specify when the web app is finally deployed as an executable file. When it's executed from the IDE, the app will create a folder named Extra inside the Documents folder if it doesn't already exist. In addition, we will also check if it's the first time that the app is run or if that folder exists already. That is something done by comparing the F variable against nil and also checking the exists property for the folder item variable. So if F points to a valid object but the exists property returns false, then that will mean that the folder doesn't exist yet. So we create it calling the create folder method on the F variable. And because we are wrapping the code in a try-catch block, it will print any error to the console if there was an error trying to execute that line of code. Next, we'll reuse the same variable so it points now to the path already set on it, that is the extra folder inside the documents folder, plus the file name dbfile.sqlite using the folder item method child for that. In fact, this is the name of the file that we'll use as the SQLite database file. We're also declaring a variable that will act as a flag in order to know if it's the first time we run the app or not. Because if it is the first time we execute the app, then we will need to create the inner structure of the SQLite database itself. This means like the tables we'll use in order to store the, the app's data. If the database file doesn't exist yet, then that means this is the first time our app has been run and we call the create database method from the SQLite database class, setting also the first run variable to true. Once we assign the variable that points to the database file to the database file property, and once we create the database file itself, we proceed to call the connect method on the SQLite database class so it connects the database engine with the database file itself. Next, if this is the first time we ran the app, then we will call the create tables method on our subclass. If we look at the code on that method whose scope is set to protected, which means that it only can be called from the class or other subclasses based in this class, then the first thing we do is call the execute SQL method from the SQLite database class, giving as the parameter the content stored in the task table constant and exactly the same thing with the user's table constant. These are the two constants added to the class containing the sentences in the SQLite language needed to create both tables inside our SQLite file. If we select the tasks table constant and inspect its contents, we can see how the creation of the tasks table is very simple. Composed from a total of four columns, storing the ID for the record, the ID for the user, the task name, and the task status. For the user's table constant, we can find nearly the same SQL code for creating the table with only two columns, the record ID and the username. Going back to our constructor method, we set the write ahead logging property from the SQLite database class to true. This will set the SQLite database in a multi-user mode that is what we expect, so multiple users can access our SQLite database at the same time. And that's all for our constructor method. In addition to the constructor method, we added another series of methods specific to the task at hand. Those will be responsible for adding or retrieving users, usernames from the database, storing and retrieving the tasks for a specific user, or changing a task for a specific task from a specific user. For example, if we look into the add task for user method, we see how it receives two parameters, task as string and the username also as a string. Now the first line of code in the method simply takes the username parameter, converts it to a lowercase and removes any undesired blank at the beginning or end of the string stored on it. That means that all the usernames will be stored in lowercase, which is okay in this case because it will unify the data and we'll simplify the queries when looking for a specific user. Then we are using the SQL select method from the SQLite database class to retrieve from the database any existing record from the users table that matches the username received as a parameter.
If we don't get any records, that would mean that we need to create a new record for that user first, calling the add user, user method from our subclass. That method will return the ID for the user record, so we store it in the user ID variable. In case there is already a record for the user, we simply assign the record ID to the user ID variable because we're going to need it in our next query against the database. If we inspect the add user method, you can see how simple it is because we use execute SQL method to create a new record in the users table, setting the name column to the username received as the parameter and returning the ID for the last added record. Here you can see the question mark character in the SQL array. That character acts as a placeholder that will be binded to the parameter given as part of the execute SQL sentence. So in this case, it will be binded to the username variable. That's very useful because this class of SQL binding in Sojo means protecting the database against some very common malicious attacks. Going back to the add task for user method, and once we get the ID for the user record, we simply need to call the execute SQL method in order to insert a new task into the task table from the database, providing the user ID and task variables that, once again, will be binded to the two placeholders used in the SQL sentence. User ID against the first one from the left and task against the second one. The third parameter for the new record is always zero because a new created task will have its status set to no, no completed. Once the new record has been created in the database, we assign a new pair data type to uh, instance to the P variable, providing as arguments of the ID of the added record and the ID for the user. A pair data type is a class that allows it to store, well, a pair of data values. That is two members, left and right. So it's very common to use it when working with linked lists and other structures of data. Let's see now how to delete tasks from our database. We added the delete tasks for user method to our class for that. This method receives the parameter task ID as a pair data type. The left and right members of this pair are storing the IDs for the task and the user respectively. So we only need to call the execute SQL method with the SQL sentence to delete the record from the tasks table, whose ID is the one found in the left member of the task ID parameter. Our class also has the update task method that will be in charge of updating a task status for a specific user. So the method receives as parameters the tasks ID pair, task ID's pair data type and the status to be set as a Boolean value. So again, we're going to use the execute SQL method from the SQLite database, passing along the SQL sentence to update the record ID, record matching ID, for the task with the value provided by the status parameter. The last method we're going to use is the one that's in charge of receiving all the task records for any given user provided by the username parameter. We start by converting the username to lowercase and removing any extra blank spaces. And then we call the select SQL method from the SQLite database class. With this, we pass along the SQL sentence to retrieve all of the records from the tasks table whose user ID column matches the value got after we queried the users table for the ID that matched the name column with the provided username value. As a result, we will get a row set instance containing all of the records that match that query. So if it's not a valid row set instance or the after last row property is set to true, that would mean that we're dealing with a new username that's still not available in the users table. So in this case, we simply add the new user to the user's table in the database. In both cases, the method will return the row set pointed by the RS variable. So that's everything our, task t our TaskDB subclass does. What's next? Well, because the web app is going to be used by multiple users, the most convenient thing is to add every, have every one of them have their own connection to the database. For that, we only need to add a, a new property to the session object, in this case named db, and whose type is set to our class task db. In addition, we're going to add a second property to the session object, whose type is set to string, and that will be in charge of storing the current user entered in the username text field. Finally, the code in the sessions object open event handler will create a new instance from our task db class, assigning to it the db property. As for the new UI controls used in the web page layout, 
Let's start with the press event handler for the get button. That one will simply call the get records method. It's a method that's added to the task manager page whose code will be in charge of deleting the current contents from the task list web list box and then retrieve the row set with the task records for the user typed in the username text field. If the row set is a valid object and it contains records, we will iterate it to access every record to update the task list web list box with the new data and setting also the status column in the web list box for every task row. In addition, we will add a new pair instance with the record ID and the user ID as the row tag tag on every row added to the task list. That way it will be easier to retrieve those values later when the user wants to change a task status or if they want to delete a given task. On the pressed event handler for the add button, we made some changes so it can now work with our database. Basically, it takes care of updating the current user property in the session object in case it's not the same one typed in the text field. If that is the case, the method also retrieves and displays the records for the current user. After that, the code will simply call the add task for user method on the task DB instance stored in the DB property for the session object, updating the web list box afterwards. We need to do some changes also in the pressed event handler for the delete button. In this case, we simply call the delete task for user method in the DB task instance stored in the DB property for the session object. We pass along the value stored as the row tag for the selected row in the web list box, updating it afterwards. As for the text changed event handler in the task field, we enable the add button control so the username text property is not empty and we disable it otherwise. This is the same thing we would do in the text changed event handler for the username text field control. In this case, we'll enable or disable the button in charge of getting the tasks record, task records for the entered username. Finally, in the pressed event handler for the task list web list box, we change the existing code so it can call the update task on the task DB instance, passing along the parameters both for the row tag value for the selected row in the list box and the current status for the selected task. So these are the changes added to the original tutorial so it can save and retrieve tasks, update their status, and also be able to support several tasks for as many users that we want. Everything that we've done here is using a SQLite database.